everybody, we have another terrific conversation, insights and design, so we can talk about anything, hobbies, investments, etc. We have Mikhail Sven, who's here just in time, just flew in, his arms are tired, Dwight Merriman, <laughs> MongoDB, so Zendesk, MongoDB, two people who've been transformative in the enterprise space and beyond. You're now an author who's been just finished startup land. You can give us news from the front. And of course, Dwight, you've been an investor and you've done double click. And so I think there's a lot of perspectives here. Let's start with what you're seeing in terms of the enterprise and just your own businesses. Zendesk, I'm going to start because you're on the far. I was speaking with Freshdesk yesterday. There's like, it's a hot space. What's so sexy right now about essentially software and customer service software? Well, I think enterprise software is like, we're seeing the start of a big democratization of enterprise software. And we see users craving and wanted that kind of same emotional um, connection with their business software the same way we have it with our consumer software. But now, is democratization basically that people can bring all the shiny toys into the business and CIOs have no control over it? Is it that it's the user experience? No, 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 no. That's, uh, what does that's, that mean? That's bring your own. Uh, no, I think I democratization like means that we are whole, we are a whole series of companies right now that are working very hard to kind of compress the stack, democratize the stack, and make great software, transformative software, available for everybody, for small businesses, for large enterprises, and thereby completely changing the dynamics of doing business. So I'm a CIO, I'm very worried. I want to get a sense of sort of where the world's going. Talk about MongoDB, it's another space where you're seeing a lot of action at the moment. And I know that obviously you've been around for some time, but talk a little bit even about open source and what you see in terms of the default of how I should be thinking about building enterprise in my company. Yeah, I think people are, we're, we're now to the point where people are defaulting to open source. So there was a point where the question might have been, if you're my boss, is it okay if I use something that's open source? Now it's, is it okay if I use something that isn't? So I yeah. feel like for enterprise software, going forward, it's really two buckets. It's either open source or it's SaaS. Right, so for an application, I might be, I like SaaS, so I'm going to use a lot of that, and I'm not really worried about the open source aspect. And all SaaS because it's built on open source. Yeah, and, but, but it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, this, it's sort of somebody else's, that piece somebody else is running for me, but the in house, I really want it to be open source, and that kind of, when I talk to CTOs, that combination seems to work really well for them. I think what you said a second ago is true, where you, the stack, you know, if we go back in time, it's very monolithic, right? There was a stack, but you, like you might be presented with an entire stack of 10 things tall from one vendor, and you have to choose this one or this one. So that's not the case anymore. So who should, and, oh, go ahead. And, and then the one, the one last thing is, is the, the one thing that I work on and that I'm really excited about is that the data layer, that specific slice of the stack, I think we're seeing the biggest change in that layer that we've seen in 30 years right now. So talk about where you see some of the opportunities and even just managing the growth. There's been a lot of focus here around when you're in a time of exciting growth, the markets you've relatively reached, but talk about going public. There's been a lot of attention to the number of tech companies that have been going public, for example. Do you feel like you've had the experience? Are you glad you went public? Do you think that we're in an overvalued, frothy market or are we just at the beginning of Good times for all. <laughs> now, I think it's fantastic being public. It's been fantastic for Zendesk. We've been a public co uh, company for, uh, for almost a year now, yeah. and it's just been an amazing experience. And um, we, had, like, I think it, it works well with our DNA, and I think it works well with a lot of modern, you know, uh, technology companies today because we build on transparency and empowerment. So it works really well with the public market. The public market is also a hot mistress, you know. Yeah, <laughs> it it it. You it, have to talk to investors. What sorry? You have to talk to investors every quarter and give them numbers. Well, you just have to be responsible every single day. And like, if you're like, if you're a little bit out of you know out of out of your way, you're being beaten back to your to your path. So it's like there's a natural kind of valuation correction in the public markets, um, that may be somewhat different than what we see in the private markets right now. So the private markets, you're also somebody that's been very active as a venture capitalist, Dwight, and even from, in terms of when you look at the enterprise space versus the consumer space, do you feel like it's quite frothy? We are seeing valuations that give people pause, um, and 
What are you looking at? Do you feel like it's frothy? Is there a bubble? <laughs> well, the valuations are pretty good. So if you're an entrepreneur, I think it's a good time to raise money. Um, but I don't think it's a bubble. You know, I, would, I remember back in 2000 being right in the heart that of that. That was a bubble. Like when, like, at Double Click, when two thirds of our customers went out of business, right? So we didn't, but it was hard, right? And I don't. This feels completely different, just sort of qualitatively. Um, there's just so much happening, and 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 if you look at the numbers, I mean, some of these companies are making a lot of money. Like, the, the, it, it's not the, uh, uh, that there isn't anything under there. So, um, so I think this is a good time uh, uh, overall. What are you excited about? If you're an investor, if I give you both money, I'm going to take you both within your companies, but also. What do you think are some of the untapped opportunities or where would you be looking for us to perhaps be exploring more this time next year? And, and <laughs> let's see from where you are in terms of... I think at least in the world of business applications, I think that we are, we're, over the next five, 10 years, we'll see a shift where like business software will be a service that you don't necessarily, like, the, like workflow systems and like setting up payroll stuff and like all that stuff, you're not gonna pay for all these things. It's gonna be a service, but what you're really going to be willing to pay for are the data and the insight and what you learn about the markets and your customers and your employees from these systems. So I see a shift from kind of a software transaction economy to a much more uh, data insights driven economy. So right now it feels like the companies are taking the data and not necessarily sharing the value with the customers. Is that changing? Are you, you've just come back, you've talked to a lot, you talked to a lot of customers, both of you. Do you find the conversations changing around what they want from you? Yeah, but totally, like, I, I think there's, like, for example, Sendesk is a customer service software company, and right. we help customers, we help companies better engage with their customers. So we have all these workflow systems, and we can support all these channels, and just make it easy and nice. But ultimately, you know, they're not just satisfied with being able to manage their relationships. What they ultimately want is like all these interactions they have to cope with customers, they want to find the signal in the noise and understand what's really going on with our customers and how can that help me drive my business and, and do new things with my customers. And over time, that's where companies will be willing to invest their money. Give me, go ahead. Yeah, I, I think there's, it's a critical time like in business, like if, if you know, we're out there as business people that, you know, we, it, it's absolutely imperative that we you move fast and you're nimble and you're agile. I mean, we literally use the word agile all, every day, like when we talk about software development these days, and, and, and get our customers what they really want. What yeah. do they want? Well, they want a lot. They have high expectations. You know, they want to be able to access their data from you, the vendor, in real time, from their smartphone, and, 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 and transact with you in the same way. So we, we need all of these things as, as businesses and those are hard, and we got to move quickly, or we'll, we'll all, whoever the company is, we we'll just get, yeah. get squished by our competition. So, so it, it, there's a very key mindset there, I think, from the IT, if you will, uh, in all companies that, that they need to think about that. And then, and then with that lens, then you can go out there and you can find there's a tremendous amount of stuff out there that can help you do that these days. So I know you're not in the CEO, but what do you see as the toughest business challenge that, that you're dealing with right now? What do you see as some of the things that doesn't have to keep you up at I night? Mean, is it the managing the growth? Yeah. Is it the talent? It's, <laughs> we, it's always hard to hire, and it's our number one. You hire a lot in New priority. York. Yeah. Do you hire a lot in Silicon Valley? What's interesting is you're both. I mean, I know you've got big operations, but you're both relative outsiders. I mean, and everybody's got a tech hub that they're, you know, Las Vegas, Ireland. <laughs> what? I mean, give me some sense of where do you find the opportunity, even around as you're managing growth. Are you starting to hire differently? You're starting to hire more internationally? Well, um, I think there's no doubt that San Francisco, Silicon Valley is the mothership. You know, that's where the action, <laughs> sorry. That, is that's it? where the action is, that's where the money is, that's where the amazing talent is, that's where the good weather is. <laughs> and, but it's like everybody and their mother is there right now. Yeah. So the, like, just the six years I've been in San Francisco, the economy has gone through the roof and it's crazy overheated. I, like if I came as a new entrepreneur to San Francisco, I wouldn't be able to afford a place to live. It's just out of control right now. So that means a company like us, we have to think much differently about recruiting. And so we've set up like five development centers around the world. 
uh, where we hire engineers because there's great engineers everywhere and uh, you know with different aspirations and different ideas about you know work-life balance and so on. Why five instead of two or three? Um, because it's just been, uh, it's been, it's been actually been really rewarding to set up these uh, cells that owns a part of the product and can work yeah. autonomously, uh, and they work really well that way. Yeah, you need sales and support in multiple places anyway. Oh, you have sales yeah, and support. Yeah. What right. would you yeah. say? Yeah. So I've now made you the CEO of Zendesk. Well, what I would you be agree. doing? Well, it, I like the idea of having a second office, right? Right. Uh, um, this, it, but it's uh, sort of the saying is in greater than one, or, or, or has it got to be five? And, and, uh, and we do similar things then, but we've had very good luck hiring engineers in New York. Yep. And I'm very pleased and uh, it's hard, but it's hard everywhere. And like you say, and the problem with uh, Silicon Valley is there's it's it's plenty of supply, but there's plenty of demand. <laughs> I mean, there's a tremendous amount of demand. So if you look at the balancing of that, sure. So, Those two, it, it's actually quite hard to So we have a lot of entrepreneurs here and people that are selling to companies. What did, I don't want to make it too much, you know, 30,000 foot advice, but I want to talk more personally. What have you found were some of the underappreciated um, aspects even in your own success? Mikkel, I mean, you arrived from outside the country. You write about this in startup land. Give me some sense since most ideas do fail, you know, from double click, two thirds of the customers went away. Maybe two thirds of the people here will reemerge in some other form. Any advice, even in terms of besides having a great business idea, as to what makes somebody last for the long term? You well, had dark moments. Well, you should never underestimate the role of, of luck and timing in building anything. Like, we've been very lucky. We had no, when we started out building Sendesk, as I have described in my book, um, we, didn't, we didn't had no idea what we were doing. Why did you write a book anyway? Because it's, um, I think because first and foremost, like we are a company now with a lot of employees, with a lot of shareholders, with a lot of stockholders, with a lot of customers, users, uh, together it's millions of people. I think that having something that describes the origin of, of something you're working with is a good idea. And then I hope also it, it can be a good you know, inspiration for especially maybe entrepreneurs outside of the Silicon Valley ecosystem and give them a little bit of an insight into how is it working, seen from, seen from somebody who came from the inside and, and has been working on the inside. You know, in terms of, uh, for what's your next book? No, I'm kidding, but, it, but give me some <laughs> sense of, 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 in terms of when you're looking at the landscape right now, we talk a lot about Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, but more generally, I'm gonna take you both to say the 202 area code in Washington. There's been a lot of discussion around security and such here. How should we be thinking about that? Are we not really appreciating maybe sort of some of the things that are happening on the policy front? Can you give advice in terms of how we should be thinking about privacy and security. There's, there's the paranoid and there is the, it'll work itself out. Where do you sit? What do you worry about? So I think there's a bunch of questions in there. Yes. I think one is I think geographically, I think you can build a company and a startup in a lot of places these days. Um, there's probably a few bad choices, but I think there's a lot of what choices that will work just fine. <laughs> Uh, I don't know, some country that's not entrepreneur friendly. <laughs> but, but you need to be able to, if it's something with tech involved, which Rhymes most things with are, no, I don't uh, know you better be able to hire good engineers. Um, beyond that, I think, it, you know, the investors are, are not as focused on location anymore. It's, there's been a shift, right? And then on the, in terms of privacy and security, I think privacy, I think the important thing there is just that we always keep talking about it. Yeah. Right, in, in a big way, and there's no silver bullet there, and that's the, that's the key, that, that if, like, silence is bad. Uh, and then I think security is going to be a huge challenge for the world over the next 25 what years. Bucket, the, the and sovereign? in addition, there'll, there'll be tons of opportunities, like, to build companies that solve some of those problems along the way. But, but, but the real problem with privacy or the real issue with privacy is that so many people are sharing so much about themselves without really thinking about it. You know, they're just putting it out there and then they hook all these services up together and uh, it's not until afterwards they realize that suddenly all these services have access to all that private information. So tell me a little bit about your own activities because I think now that I always like to sort of get to the personal around privacy, give me some sense of 
of what do you do to manage your own life? And, and I see you're not, are you each wearing your, uh, you don't have your Apple watches on. Do what do you find, give me, what are the apps that, are you, that you can't live without? And are you posting photos of yourself drunk on Facebook? <laughs> no, you're not. So, so but what, what do you think is sort of, um, in terms of your own managing of privacy, knowing what you know, what, how do you manage your own life? You keep it all to your books and we'll hear about it once every few years? I, you know, I think I'm very old fashioned. I feel very old when I see how newer generations are completely native with all these like sharing messaging apps, especially like if you go to like if you go to Asia and see the proliferation of all these messaging apps and how they are blocked and you know, messaging. How many apps do you have on your phone? I, I actually pretty good at keeping it down, but I use a lot of like down to what? Like a dozen? A, I have like four screens. Four screens. Yeah, no folders. What about yourself? Uh, I have a little more than that, but I don't use them. So I only use like a dozen. dozen. So, so I, I, I actually am very much like you. I mean, like when I look at my kids, like <laughs> they're so much more savvy about this stuff. And it's like, oh, do you use it? And it's like, oh, I don't use that. Yeah, I can, I could build that for you, but I don't use it. Like I, so, so in that sense, uh, exactly the same and yeah. just Growing up as a, like a computer nerd, like I feel like I went through this phase of a decade or so at some point, yeah. where it was in every possible gadget that existed in the world, and and, and, this, and at some point, just like kind of, I don't care about that stuff anymore. Yeah. I don't really like. I'm. It's it's, it's funny. It's not, it's like a lack of interest in widgets. Well, it's interesting. It's one thing we talk about. Is that you focus very much, I think, on delighting the developers, and and that's you come at it from a technology point of view in terms of growth and who the brand ambassadors are, there's the commercial aspect and marketing. Give me some sense, the next wave, do you feel it is very much about having a consumer mindset going into the company? What does that mean? I mean, how do you sort of engage the, tech, the technologists, the developers, do you have to? Well, I think that, well, I think that we, we are, you know, we are seeing an empowerment of the consumer. The voice of the customer has never been louder than it is today. And that, it, that means that it, it has become so easy for us to take our business elsewhere. It has so, like, and, and like the, the primary marketing tool today is the word of mouth economy. Like, recommending something to somebody is the strongest marketing vehicle out there right now because of the internet, because of social media and so on. So, like, consumer businesses today, consumer-centered uh, business today, they have no choice but embrace kind of the reality of the consumer today and like and not focus on the individual transaction the individual transaction is meaningless what they have to focus on is building these lifetime oriented relationships to both make sure that that they really harvest the value of the customer but also be, turn that customer into a promoter into a fan into an evangelist of their products yeah and so, we've, we very much have done that i think with mongodb and in, in particular, because it was open source, the way we go to market with that, especially if we go back like five, six years ago, it, it, it's a lot like a consumer product yeah. going to market, yeah. where you're trying to build a community and you're doing all these things that aren't very enterprisey, even though the product is an enterprise class product can be used for any size business in the, in the end. So I, th I think we'll see more of that, where the way you go to market for B2B products will be more like yep. consumer go to market historically. Anything where, you know, if, if, if I can sign up online, you know, and for your SaaS product, whatever it is, and use it for our company, then, then the way you reach me and get me to do that is going to be a little bit more like a consumer app. So we were talking, I was talking to Atlassian yesterday where they don't have a sales force and the product just sells itself. Not a strategy? What, what's that? <laughs> you don't have a sales force, they're just called something different? What's that? <laughs> Of course, they have a sales force, you know, but I mean, no, it's a good model, but they are primarily driven by word of mouth, you know, and that is, the con that is a model for a whole new generation of enterprise software companies. Like we have, we have our business have 65% of our online leads, they come to us organically. So I want to say, and I know we're counting down, so I want to um, give you some final thoughts, and it can be, you know, advice, whatever, plastics. Give, give some thoughts as to what we'll be talking about this time next year. Mikkel. I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll talk about your dress again. 
Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but get, but what, no, I cannot leave you on that. Give me some, what's, what's fascinating to you right now, even some things that are percolating that's on your radar. Which is an audience of people that are hungry for new tech, new investment opportunities, new oh, parts of the world. But that, I think that's the thing, so many things are going on right now. The convenience economy, you know, where we can order everything. You know, Uber is completely transforming how we think about getting Not shit. in Las Vegas. Yes. I know. <laughs> so, well, and what about you? Yeah, I would kind of say the same thing. You'll see a year from now, maybe you see 10 new Ubers, not to have anything to do with transportation, but you know, we're, 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 there's been a reinvention. Where's of the an next Uber opportunity? Oh, not, there, there's not, so many. I don't, I don't know. I mean, Uber, Uber every as a service. From, Uber as a service. Think about it, like you selling selling your used car, talking to your doctor. I mean, uh, getting finding your next I thought job. I you said talking to your daughter. I'm doctor. Like, I would do that. <laughs> uh, finding your next job. It could be anything. We like uh, if you, we make a list of the 300 things we do. It's probably half of them are candidates. But then you got to figure out. Well, it's one thing to say, okay, well maybe I, there should be a different way to order a taxi, but. You haven't done anything yet. You have to say, okay, well, what's the actual embodiment that works and is optimal, yeah. and how do you bootstrap it, right? That's the hard part, but that's also and how do I get the mayor to let me operate? But that's a whole different <laughs> issue. Well, please join me in thanking these gentlemen, Thanks. and I think we'll be have some interesting conversations <laughs> to come. Thanks again.